Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the walkthrough video for answering biology questions which earn more than 5 marks. This could be a 6 mark question or a 5 mark question. It could be GCSE Biology, it could be a level biology or any other level of biology where there are more marks awarded. I usually begin by taking off a minute or two before I read the actual question I'm supposed to attempt. So if it's data, I'm going to look for trends as well as patterns and I will study if there is a correlation and if it's there, is it positive or is it negative? I also look for consistency in the results. Were there repeat experiments? Were means calculated? Are there standard deviations given? I try to find ways of connecting data and this is more helpful if you have multiple data sets. Then other sides of the graphs or the tables, I try to write some information. I think some of you who have seen my past papers have answered. You've seen around the tables or around any graphs. I try to write some small statements that are going to help me in answering the question. These could be, if I'm seeing any trends, you do not have to write real words. Just put arrows whether something increases or decreases. This will help you when you're answering the question. Number one, you save time and you'll not make a mistake to come back and read the graph again because you've gone through it already. So the key things we have to focus on, you need to read the question carefully. Here, you try to understand the requirements from the question before starting your answer. And while reading, try to underline the key words in the question. It could be command words or any other words that are relevant to the question. Try to underline them because they're going to be helpful. In the end, you will look back and see the underlined words to see if in your answer you've included things that were required for that question. Then after reading the question, now you're trying to attempt. You need to spare maybe a minute or so to plan your answer. So for those of you who have already gone through the data and you've already written some points around the data sets, it will be easier for you to plan. This will take a shorter period of time. So you spend a few minutes planning your answer. Make sure you do not rush the answer. Break down the question to identify key terms and components. Your response should be tailored best on the command words in the question. And again, remember command words are very important. And look at the video I made about command words. And in your answer, remember that each command word may require a different approach. For example, if it's a question about discuss or explain, they will require different methods of answering. The next part is avoid bullet points and be concise. Bullet points could only be used if it's listing. Maybe they tell you list, but if not, it's better you write in full sentences. So write clearly and in full sentences and try to connect your answer to biological concepts or theories. Try to use scientific terms. In your writing, be clear, be direct and avoid writing unnecessary information. You also have to maintain a logical flow of clear transitions between points, meaning try to link your points correctly and stay focused on the points raised in the question. Again, here I'm referring to the parts that you underlined in the question, the keywords. When you're answering stay forecast, do not deviate away from the keywords that are required in the question. The next, provide examples. These examples could be from your data, and these are going to be relevant to support your data. They could be from the question, from statements. They could be from a table or from a graph. You try to provide these examples. And actually, there are six more questions that do not give you any data. Maybe they just ask you to describe or explain something. To those, you have to give examples from your own knowledge or from your notes that you studied in order to back up your answer to earn four marks. The next point is you need to provide evidence. This is from the data that has been given. So you need to back up your arguments with evidence from the provided data. Here you can include numerical data or statistics to strengthen your argument. For example, if repeat experiments are carried out, you need to talk about that. The means were calculated, there is standard deviation, you could even calculate percentage increase, percentage decrease, and so on. Marks are usually awarded for some calculations or some data included. Your own knowledge may also be required in explaining processes included in the question. This could be a theory, for example, a question about respiration could require you to briefly include details on respiration. Or a question about enzymes could require you to include how they work, even though this is not directly inferred in the question. Next, consider alternative perspectives. This could be in some questions, maybe those that require you to discuss and so on, or assess the information. Remember to acknowledge and address counter arguments. Do not be one-sided for some kinds of questions. Sometimes they want you to give pros and cons. Try not to be cited 
when you're trying to answer questions. And lastly, look back and evaluate your answer. You should review your answer for factual correctness. Refer back to all your points or link forward to subsequent ones where appropriate. And then assess the strength and weakness of your answer. Then you try to proofread in order to check for correct spellings as well as coherence. So I included some examples of six mark questions. The first example says describe the structure and function of the mitochondria in eukaryotic cells. Here the keywords are we need to describe, but we are focusing on the structure as well as the function of the mitochondria. So I could say the mitochondria are double membrane organelles found in eukaryotic cells. They are responsible for aerobic respiration. The outer membrane allows the passage of small molecules while the inner membrane is highly folded into Christi, increasing the surface area for oxidative phosphorylation within the mitochondria. And then the matrix contains enzymes involved in the citric acid cycle. The mitochondria contain circular DNA. They are responsible for generating ATP through the process of oxidative phosphorylation, utilizing the energy released during the breakdown of glucose and other respiratory substances. The next example is explain how the structure of a leaf is adapted for photosynthesis. In explained questions, we have to describe and give a reason. And in this case, we are focusing on the structure of the leaf. So I could say the leaf structure is highly adapted for photosynthesis. The upper epidermis is transparent, allowing light to penetrate into the leaf. And beneath the epidermis are layers of palisade mesophyll cells which contain numerous chloroplasts, and these cells are arranged vertically to maximize light absorption. The spongy mesophyll located below the palisade layer has numerous intercellular spaces. This provides a large surface area for gas exchange, and it facilitates the diffusion of gases. The stomata, located primarily on the lower side of the leaf, regulate gas exchange by opening and closing to control the influx of carbon dioxide and the release of oxygen. Then I could say, additionally, the presence of a network of veins ensures efficient transport of water and nutrients to the leaf cells. The third example, discuss the process of meiosis and its significance in sexual reproduction. I could say meiosis is a type of cell division that occurs in sexually reproducing organisms, resulting in the formation of gametes, which are sperm or egg cells. The process involves two successive divisions known as meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, each consisting of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase stages. Meiosis 1 is a reduction or division where the homologous chromosomes pair up and exchange genetic material through crossing over in prophase 1. An independent assortment occurs in metaphase 1, leading to genetic variation. During anaphase 1, homologous chromosomes are separated reducing the chromosome number by half. And meiosis 2 produces haploid cells instead of diploid ones. As a result, meiosis generates genetic diversity among offsprings through the shuffling of alleles and independent assortment of chromosomes, contributing to the adaptation and evolution of populations. And question four, compare and contrast the structure and function of DNA and RNA and again, the focus is on structure and function. So it means I have to talk about the structure of DNA and RNA, the similarities, the differences, and then talk about the function. But I do not have to write them as bullet points, so I could write in full sentences. I could say DNA and RNA are both nucleic acids involved in the storage and transmission of genetic information. DNA is double-stranded with a deoxyribose sugar and phosphate backbone, in nitrogen bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. RNA is usually single-stranded, containing ribose sugar, and the bases adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. While DNA is mainly located in the cell's nucleus, RNA is found both in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. DNA serves as a blueprint for protein synthesis, while RNA acts as an intermediary molecule in protein synthesis. RNA includes messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA. Overall, DNA provides the genetic instruction for cellular processes, while RNA helps carry out these instructions through transcription and translation. 
so this brings us to the end of this video thank you for being with us do not forget to subscribe see you in the next video bye bye